Once the government sticks its fingers in something, it becomes entrenched. It's much easier to stop government from getting involved in an area than to stop its expansion. Society is a balance between liberty and security. And when you want more security, you're going to have less liberty. The encroachment of government overreach dominated the first half of the 20th century. Little by little, the federal government assumed more power, limiting the economic possibilities of a free market and robbing many of the American dream. In a composite nation like ours, as before the law, there should be no rich, no poor, no high, no low, no white, no black, but common country, common citizenship, equal rights, and a common destiny. Frederick Douglass. <laughs> The Roaring Twenties were marked by continued innovation and progress. The stock market rose to unprecedented heights during this era, as everyday Americans sought to invest in their future. But by the end of the decade, this epic boom ended in a catastrophic bust, providing the opportunity for a new leader to set a drastically different path for the federal government. Well, the stock market collapse was incredibly severe. That happened, of course, in October of 1929. I mean, Hoover raised taxes massively. He increased tariffs, which was one of the things that really made, created a global economic crisis. And when Hoover was up for re-election, the unemployment rate was over 20%. So of course, he was going to be defeated. And FDR was an optimist. I didn't, I didn't agree with his policies, but he talked about it, the economy in an in a optimistic way, and he said he was for the little guy, and those kinds of things really resonated with voters. He won an overwhelming election and was re-elected three times, but his policies were, for the most part, disastrous. There were several serious economic contractions in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, that corrected themselves because nobody stepped in. It was a Great Depression because government jumped in and did so many negative things to the free functioning of the economy. We took a financial crisis that basically could have been over in a year or two, and government rushed in and did all the wrong things, raised taxes, massively increased government spending and debt, put out new regulations and so on, which turned a you know, it would have been a short-term, maybe 18-month financial crisis into a 10-year Great Depression. So when FDR started his plan with the New Deal, what ended up happening is he fundamentally re-altered the relationship between the individual and the government. He had a vision of, it was almost like European socialism or fascism, where you kind of take care of people from cradle to grave. And that wasn't the way that America was set up. In many respects, we're still dealing with the aftershocks of that because it's pretty hard to have a society that is going to basically take care of you from start to finish and still be a society based on liberty. And so I would argue that FDR set us off on a way that started valuing security over liberty, and we've been trying to reestablish that balance ever since. I mean, one of the great mythologies, of course, of history is that the Franklin Roosevelt New Deal worked. No, it didn't. It didn't work. Even eight years after Franklin Roosevelt was president, we still had double digit unemployment. How is that a success by any means? And by the way, Herbert Hoover, of course, one of our worst presidents, did a lot of wrong things as well. So policy mistakes can turn a short term crisis into a long term crisis and often do. President Roosevelt created a new labyrinth of bureaucracy that was completely foreign to our constitution, giving himself control over the decisions of private banks, setting both wages and prices and artificially micromanaging every aspect of the economy from the top down. This radical response to the Great Depression set a precedent for unchecked government that would continue to haunt Americans to this day. Taking the Constitution seriously is, is something that we don't do anymore. You hear a lot of rhetoric about the Constitution, but not much understanding of what it implies. It is designed to limit government. It doesn't give people 
control over everything, it does control the government. That's what the founders understood, the framers understood. As James Madison said, crisis is the rallying cry of the tyrant. Government uses crisis to expand its powers. And we saw that in spades in the COVID pandemic, where government used COVID as an excuse to take on extraordinary powers, extraordinary increases in government spending. Uh, the government now could tell you they were setting curfews, telling them if you could go outside your home. They were telling businesses whether they could stay open or not. They were telling businesses how many workers they could hire. Uh, they were shutting down parks. They were shutting down churches. They were shutting down playgrounds and, and schools. That was all justified because of a crisis. I often think that the hardest thing for a leader to do is restraint. And particularly a politician, when they get elected, they often get elected promising to do something. And often, the greatest thing a politician can do is actually not to do anything. If there is an economic crisis, let it work itself out. Just take a step back, create the space for the private sector and individuals to solve these very problems. To me, that's what a leader really knows what to do. They know when to act and when not to act. But I think for, for politicians, one of the strongest things they could do is actually their actions maybe should be about shrinking the government, should be shrinking the regulatory framework, should be about shrinking taxation so that you can open up this space for the private sector and individuals to solve our problems. It tends to be that wealth and job creation happens when the government is in retreat, not when it's expanding. Because the government can only spend a dollar if it takes a dollar away from a private citizen or a private business. Government uh, doesn't stimulate, it destimulates. So all throughout American history, we have this system, this constitutional system, and it's always gonna be challenged. And I know 100 years from now into the future, it will continue to be challenged. That's part of what happens. So the strength of our system is when it does face a challenge, how resilient is it? And so when FDR started to try to do things such as court packing, there was this pushback both from the legal side, but also politically. There were some people in, in, in that was like, okay, things are going too far. While the shift in our government structure never fully went away, post-war America did see a drift back towards liberty. The remarkable recovery that ensued proved that a limited government creates a climate for economic success. One of the things that hasn't been discussed so much is how much of the New Deal was repealed after World War II, which I would argue is one of the reasons that you started having so much economic success in the post-war era in the 50s into the 60s. So following the Great Depression, everyone remembers in their textbooks all these ABC organizations. So many were created and there was so much bureaucracy that was generated. What history forgets about is after World War II, so many of those were just canceled and ripped out and actually had this period of government shrinking following the war. And then you also had the loosening of all the wartime restrictions and, and all this pent up demand. And that just pushed growth into in the 50s and into the 60s. We saw the biggest decline in government in the history of the United States. So in 1946, 45 or 46, government was like 46% of our economy. By 1948, it was down to like 12%. So that massive downshifting of government freed up all these resources for a ferocious post-World War II recovery, um, which flies in the whole face of the Keynesian idea that you need more government spending. No, the economy exploded when we cut government. A dollar not spent by the government is a dollar that can be spent by a private entrepreneur or a private business. So that post-World War II boom kind of crashed when it hit some of the inflationary problems with the Vietnam War. You also had industries that were very competitive in the 50s and 60s, but had invested in themselves in 20 years. So you had high inflation, you had sectors of the economy that were not competitive. You had a lot of problems and a lot of stagnation. And I remember my parents telling me stories of 20% interest rates trying to buy homes. In that economic environment, there was no incentive to innovate. So when Reagan came in and got elected and he crushed inflation and then he reduced the tax rate, all of a sudden you had capital ready to invest again. And so there was all these innovations on the, you know, in computers, in the internet, and in all the various technologies and telecom that finally they had an investment grade cash ready to go to bring those products to market. And that started this boom in the 1980s that, hey, when I was growing up in high school in the 1990s, it started to really mature and became the driver of our economy. 
I was starting a new political party, and so I had to be critical of Reagan. But I was too critical of him. I, you know, after he retired, the daily radio, I think 90 second commentaries or two minute commentaries he had, uh, were handwritten by Reagan himself. And they were very sophisticated things. You assume a guy who's, you know, no longer president, he's got all these people writing things for him. He wrote them himself. And, and they cited Hayek and, and Mises and, uh, and Friedman himself. So one of the great challenges you have is as society becomes more complex, there's this greater desire for, for politicians and bureaucrats to regulate that complexity. And so when you started having all of this growth following the 1980s and 1990s, many of the industries that really prospered, such as tech, it prospered because there was very few restrictions on it. It was a new world. And then you start, when, it, when these industries start to mature, well, that's when the bureaucrats start to step in. Despite the lessons of our history, many Americans still favor a larger central government at the cost of individual liberty. Today, the socialist movement swells at an alarming pace. The fundamental problem with socialism is a simple thing. We're not all the same. If we were all the same, if we all could just be programmed, um, socialism would be great because then we could dictate, okay, you do this, you do that, we'll all get the same money, everything would be great. When you talk about it that way, people realize how silly the notion of socialism is. And yet here we are again, with, we actually have senators in the United States Senate that put socialists on their business card. I find that fascinating. So every single time you have a massive challenge, whether it be a war or an economic recession, there's this temptation to get out there and fix the problem and we're gonna have some kind of new policy and, and somehow the system wasn't working. But when we look back over 200 years in our constitution and our system, we've gone through droughts, we've gone through civil war, we've gone through economic depressions, we've gone through just about every imaginable problem. And my lesson from American history is if it, the temptation to throw out the system, to throw out the filibuster, to throw out um, our elected way of doing things. If you do that, it will be different, but it may not be an improvement. All of this has led us to where America stands now and has set up the challenges facing our nation in the modern day.